Good morning. This is November 29th, 1999, here in Natick, Massachusetts. This is the part of the Morse Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Program. And this morning we have with us Arthur Haywood. Arthur, welcome to our program here. Can you mind if I ask you what your age is? Uh, uh, 73. 73, and uh, what is your address, please, <coughs> in Natick? In, in Natick, Mass. Yep, and what is your current marital status? I'm married. And do you have children? Oh, yeah, seven. Seven children? Seven children. And how about grandchildren? <coughs> and I have uh, four or five uh, grandchildren. You must have had a very busy Thanksgiving <laughs> at your house. I did, I did. <laughs> Lots of turkey. Right. <laughs> Where were you born, Arthur? I was born in West Newton. And raised there, or? Right, raised there, went to high school there. And um, when did you come to Natick? I came to Natick uh, 20 years ago. About 1979, something right, like that? Right, right. Okay. And what was the community like when you got here? Do you remember that? Uh, Natick was a community that you could easily get involved with because uh, uh, two of my kids were still in, uh, in school and they went to a uh, coal school and from there they went to uh, Natick High. And uh, my, uh, my, my son was involved with a uh, Natick football team and that was a plus. And uh, my daughter went to BC and she was involved with uh, the flag team and it was the same years that Doug Flutie was at BC. So we had a very close relation with the athletes at uh, BC. How did, you, uh, how did you get involved? Well, I, I went to all the games. I'll bet you did. <laughs> I'll bet you <laughs> and, did. And <laughs> uh, uh, when uh, the BC went on the road, they took their flag team with them, and that made a great experience for Francine. So your daughter went to that? Right. She went to. Did you go to any of those road games? No, I didn't. I wasn't able to go. Were you working here then? Yes, I was uh, still at the uh, police station in Newton. Were you a police officer? No, I was a civilian. Okay, and uh, can you tell us anything about your family background, your, your father and mother? Well, my father was born in uh, Dorchester. My mother was born in Lynn. And in those days, there was a close relationship because uh, the transportation was all by uh, you know, a local transportation. Streetcars Street or buses. Streetcars and yeah. buses, yeah. right. And uh, the people from Lynn and Salem used to come to Newton all the time. And uh, uh, my, uh, my grandfather lived next door. Uh, he had, uh, he owned two houses next door. And uh, he worked on the railroad. And he was a chef for the New Haven Line for 50 years. Uh, he was a chef on Roosevelt's campaign train and he has pictures of uh, standing on the platform with his uh, kitchen crew and, and Roosevelt at the time. This must be a wonderful thing for your family to have. Right, right. You must be right. very proud of that. Right. Uh, my, uh, uh, my father was connected with uh, the police department in a category of uh, 
he used to wash cars down there. And uh, lo and behold, uh, it, uh, my uh, times came around. I ended up working for the police department too. And I had uh, one brother that was a police officer. And uh, we've had a great tradition in, in Newton there. You go anywhere in Newton and ask people, do you know the Haywards? And they'll tell you which one. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been a great experience. And I'm thankful for my family of having been such honorable people. And you've got some very good memories and very historic ones too. Yeah. To have uh, been associated with President Roosevelt. Yeah, right. Yeah, that picture of Grandpa, uh, he cherished that picture. Oh boy. I hope you're taking good care of it. Yeah, we are. Uh, we are. Uh, if I look at your numbers correctly then, uh, you went into the service when you were in Newton? Yeah, right. Okay, can you tell us about that? Uh, was this about in the 40s? Right. About, I think you said 1943? Right. Um, can you tell us about joining the Army? You know, uh, during the time that I went into the Army, uh, the South was pretty well, well segregated. So for me to go into a southern area was a shock, really, because the way some of the people were treated was actually inhuman as far as I was concerned. But you have to deal with it in its content. And uh, I was fortunate enough not to be in the South that long. I was in uh, Missouri for three months, and I was in South Carolina for, for two months. You, and, well, why did you join the Army, Arthur? Well, I felt it was my duty. No, I meant other than the Navy or the Marine Corps or something. Oh, else. It, it was the only thing that was available at the time. I see. Uh, they needed uh, Army people, and uh, my brother was already, already in the Army, and uh, I f I felt actually uh, that I should join. Did you join uh, f from Newton? Yeah, from... Uh, and, and where did you go? Uh, to Fort Devens. Fort Devens. Yeah. And for basic training. Right. No, from Fort Devens, we went to Missouri for basic training. Okay. Where, where did you go in Missouri? Uh, oh, wow. Oh, the name of the camp is, I can't remember. Oh, that's, that's not really important. Can you tell us about basic training when you went in? Well, basic training was done by black uh, officers. And you were able to relate to them because uh, I am black. And the uh, vernacular that these guys used wasn't uh, actually what you would want to hear because they used a lot of profanity and you couldn't, uh, you, you couldn't correct them, not unless you <laughs> wanted to get verbally uh, abused, but uh, things uh, worked out. Uh, our uh, actually commanding uh, uh, non-com was a man that had served in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, not China but in the Pacific, and he ended up with malaria. That's why he was back in the states, but it was under control. But uh, the biggest thing that I learned while I was in the military was to get along with blacks from the north, south, and all over this country. Uh, people from different areas have different opinions on how to treat Caucasians. 
and I had uh, uh, some experiences with uh, guys from New York, Philadelphia, that were aggressive towards whites, and they were angry. And you can't be angry at the world. And uh, as after a while, after having lived with these guys for a certain number of months, you get to adjust to certain ones that you want to be around all the time and the others that you don't. And uh, I ended up with some very serious friends. And I, I, one guy I keep remembering was from Macon, Georgia. He was name was Green. And when he used to tell me how his childhood was, it almost made me cry because it was really inhuman. And then I thought to myself, if I had lived in the South during those days, I'd have been dead a long time ago. <laughs> but that's the way the Lord makes things happen. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be born here in the North. And one of the other outstanding things was both of my parents come from the North. And uh, the idea of going south to visit relatives was out of the picture because I didn't have any relatives from the South. And uh, as time went by and I went overseas and was able to come back whole in my right mind. Okay, let's, let's talk about that. <clears throat> you took basic training in Missouri. Right. And then where did you go from there? I went to, uh, um, oh God. Uh, it's not, not Nevada, but not uh, Wyoming. You were Fort, sent to Wyoming? What, yeah, Fort yeah. Francis, uh, Francis E. Warren in Wyoming, in, uh, yeah. What time of the year was that? That was in the fall. I'm just thinking of going up there in the winter time. Oh, yeah, be yeah, tough. yeah, right. And but, what, did, what did you do in Wyoming? I went to a school on clothing repair, of all things. Uh, I took a... Uh, course in uh, repairing uh, sewing machines and because that was we were going to be put in a unit that was a, a portable uh, uh, vehicles that had sewing machines in them and we were going to just actually repair clothing. And being a service company, that's what you had to do. You had to do whatever service that you were able to uh, provide. So this was uh, your specialized training. Right. Uh, fixing sewing machines. Right. Which and would go uh, into other army units? Yeah, right. Is that it? We were sh uh, shipped into units where we could repair the clothing. And how many of you uh, were in a pat one unit? Oh, yeah. Uh, in a truck, for example? Yeah. A small number, like uh, 75, uh, 75 men to a unit. And then after we got overseas... Well, wait a minute, uh, Arthur. Tell me more about the unit. Um, it, 75 it, men, what did they do? They... Uh, learned how to put a sewing machine together from scratch and operate it. And you had to be pretty fast uh, to pass the test uh, to go further along on uh, what we were there for. And you had trucks with sewing machines yeah. in them. And yeah. how many men, for example, w would be assigned to a truck? Oh. I'd say maybe uh, 15. 
And did you have your own special truck that you were assigned yeah. to? Right. With a group of other men that yeah. uh, stayed with that truck? Right. Okay. And then, so where did you go from Wyoming? We went to South Carolina. And uh, that was my first time in the Deep South. And boy, did I learn a lesson down there. <laughs> What, uh, what town in South we, Carolina were you in? Uh, Jacksonville. Jackson. Right. Camp Jackson. Yeah. Outside Jackson. of Columbia. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We were, we were going to go in town one day, and uh, three of my friends, and we get on the bus. The bus was empty, and uh, we waited like a half an hour, and the bus never left. So we said, "Ask the driver, when are we leaving?" He says, we ain't leaving nowhere until you boys get in the back. So that was my first lesson about being in the South and uh, not uh, being withstood. Uh, that was my first time in town and my last because I never went back. <laughs> Arthur, and, did the uh, Army prepare you in any way uh, by saying to you, um, when you go into this totally different area of the country, that there might be problems? Did no. they prepare you no. for this in any way? No. The only preparedness they made was probably with uh, our non com, because uh, he uh, uh, periodically would remind us that you're not home now, you're in the South. And that was a statement within itself. Uh, he was a very nice guy, and uh, I appreciate what help he did give us. So you went into Columbia once and never went back? Never went back. What they did didn't you have do? no idea of going back. <laughs> did you stay on the base? I stayed on the base. And, and the base was comprised of two sections a black section for black troops, and in between there was a, 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 a farm, a, a dairy farm, and then there was the black troops, and you were separated, and uh, you weren't allowed to go in the area where the white troops were. You had your own mess halls? And right, your own mess halls. All facilities, all right. different. So the yeah. United States military base yeah. in 1943 was segregated. Oh boy, and how. We had uh, uh, the commanding officers were all white, and uh, we didn't mind that too much because we were learning something. We were how about learning. your own non-coms? Our non-coms were black. And, uh, there was a, a, a feeling amongst some of the guys uh, to rebel against the uh, white officers. Uh, we had one guy that, that uh, lost his mind behind the pressure that they put on him. And uh, it was... Uh, you know, the, uh, when you go in, the, it's the idea of to learn as much as possible to keep yourself alive. And I tried my best to learn everything that they were teaching me. And uh, actually it paid off because there was a time that came when I had to make a decision of whether to get rid of the hand grenade I had or hold on to it and get blown up. So I hope you made the right decision. I, I, because I'm here, I, I did yeah. make the, the, the right decision. How long were you at Fort Jackson? Uh, about two months. 
Did you ever go to Charleston or any other no, place around there? never went off of that base again. I think Sumter <laughs> is a town near there. Yeah, right. Were there any, anybody, other people with you that, uh, that had been with you for a while that you could talk to about yeah. your situation? I had one friend from New Jersey that uh, was small in statue, and everybody called him Little Joe. And he was with me all the time. And actually, he came home with me. But uh, uh, some of the other guys uh, uh, came in and out of our unit. Because when we first went overseas, we were hooked up with men that had seen combat. And some of them were uh, unpredictable. You couldn't tell when they were going to go off or what. Did you, um, if, if you were in Missouri and then Wyoming and then South Carolina, it's about 1944 now, isn't it? Right. Okay. Right. Uh, can you tell us? We went overseas Thanksgiving. Of 43? Yeah. Okay. Right. And tell us about leaving South Carolina and going overseas. That was a godsend <laughs> to, to leave South Carolina. And uh, because so many of these men that I were with had no experience on boats, when we got on the ferry in, in New York, I had one guy that was standing near me. He couldn't understand how we'd gone all the way over to Europe. On, on this little skimpy <laughs> <laughs> boat. It was nothing but a ferry. <laughs> Weren't you with some guys who probably had never even seen the ocean? Yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah, that's for Did sure. Did you say a lot of New York? Yeah, yeah, right. We say a lot of New York. Did you have any chance home. to get home before you went overseas? No, no. You didn't? No. Do you know what yeah. ship you sailed over on? Oh, no, no. It was a troop ship, you know. And where did so, you go yeah. to? Uh, Le, ha Le Havre. So you went to Le France. Havre, France, right. Yeah. And from there, we got on trains that went northeast towards uh, Nuremberg. You went up into eastern Germany then? Right. Okay. Right. And how many of your unit were with you? You were with 15 guys that you oh, trained with in oh, Wyoming, and the more more men. Okay, more men, and uh, we all uh, uh, bumped up on uh, freight cars. Okay, this must be a little later than uh, 43. Then we're up into 44, maybe 45 at this time. Yeah, right. Because if you landed in France, that it must have been cleared. Yeah. Uh, tell us about arriving in Germany. Well, the devastation was still there. Railroad stations were in uh, twisted steel, and uh, some of them were upright and some of them not. But you could see that where the destruction was. And through certain areas, there, was not, there wasn't a building standing. Everything had been destroyed. Now, was this uh, Nuremberg itself, or were you in Munich? Uh, that was before we got into Nuremberg. Okay, and so you could see the destruction from the bombing. Oh, yeah, right. Was the war over yet? Yes, but the war yeah. was over. And uh, one of the things of it is, is to see that much, much destruction and see so many people homeless, it was uh, a feeling of how fortunate I am to be on a foreign soil fighting somebody else's battle and risking my life for somebody else. There's a good feeling there, even though it is a destructive uh, idea that uh, this country don't realize the uh, 
the uh, blessings that we have in this country of not having your homes destroyed. And how do the people that live there feel about coming back to their village and there's no village there? People are all dead. Uh, uh, you know, just a total destruction. Arthur, let me ask you a question here that um, you spoke earlier about a hand grenade and you had to make a decision about it. Can you tell us how that came from where you were and what you were doing? Well, at the time, we were in an area that where there was a lot of uh, hatred towards American soldiers. And a German showed up with a gun and he was he Showed up where? On our compound. Yes. And he had a gun and it was automatic. And uh, I was the only one that had anything that could, we could defend ourselves with. I was the only one that had a hand grenade. And everybody kept telling me, throw it, throw it, throw it now. And I hesitated because I knew that I had to throw at a good distance in order not to get blown up myself. And so I gave it a college try and it landed right where I had planned. And there was a big clap went up and a roar of a victory. And uh, the company commander came by that night and uh, promised me something that I never got. And I, I didn't feel bad about that at all because at least I'm alive. Some kind of reward? Yeah, but yeah. he was gonna give me something. Yeah. So. Can you tell me, good. if you were in a, an outfit um, with sewing machines and service, a service outfit as you were. Right. How did you get a hold of a hand grenade? Well, there's certain ways of doing things, you know. You can tell us now. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody's going to yell at you. Our supply sergeant <laughs> yeah. was a friend of mine. In fact, this guy was worked with my uncle on the railroad, and he come from Boston, and. Uh, he said to me one day at child time, you, you want something? He says, it may save your life one of these days. I says, what in the world can this be? So he gave me this bag, and inside the bag was a brand new uh, hand grenade. It was still in Cosmoline that they packed uh, explosives in. And uh, after I went through the line, he looked at me and winked, and uh, I told him thank you. And so uh, I told him that I hope I don't have to use this too soon. <laughs> and he laughed. But uh, I'll never forget this guy because, like I said, that he worked with my uncle on the railroad. And when we first met, he told me that. I used to, I, I think I used to work with your uncle. I said, what's his name, Bob? He said, Bob Hayward? I said, yeah, that's my uncle. He says, wow, a small world. And we had a good relationship. And uh, one of the things of it was, was we had a few guys in our outfit uh, that was in the Boston area at Fort Devens at one time. And they knew a lot of people here. And uh, I was uh, uh, thankful for the relationship. To see something like a familiar face. Yeah. Well, Arthur, can you tell us something about, um, you spoke of how you were received and treated in South Carolina. How were you received and treated in Eastern Germany? Very well. You know, uh, the uh, 
the Germans were, well, some of them were, I can't say all of them, uh, SS troopers were more strict and prejudicial than the regular soldiers. And you could tell the difference because at one time we had uh, SS troopers and regular uh, uh, Nazi soldiers in the same camp. And uh, there came time in the winter time, especially when uh, the prisoners had to uh, provide the fires for the heat and the, uh, the officers, SS officers, they refused to uh, do their part. So we had to almost physically threaten them yeah. uh, to do their part. And gradually, uh, the, the troublemakers got uh, shifted out into other outfits. But uh, those SS troopers were tough. They were really determined to have their way. You were but, there, at, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, that's all right. All right. I, I was going to ask you if um, you were there before the Russians took over that part of Germany. Right. So you were dealing strictly with the Germans. Right. Um, have you ever been back there again? No. That's one of my uh, ambitions I had. Uh, I was in Würzburg, Germany for, oh, maybe four, six months. And I knew that town like the back of my hand. And I was used to uh, surmise how that town looked now. And having talked with guys that had been stationed in uh, Würzburg, it's a whole new city now. You wouldn't know it. And uh, I uh, have uh, visions of uh, some of the places there that we occupied. We occupied uh, one of the, the biggest uh, buildings in that town that was still standing in undamaged. And it was a nice building. And uh, I... Uh, often think of the people that live there and uh, there was always a doubt whether I would ever see any of those people again. But it was a good experience. I had some good friends and uh, when uh, we left, the day that we left, uh, there was uh, uh, a lady there that I had association with named Elizabeth. And her father was an army, uh, a German soldier. Mm -hmm. And he came down to his truck and gave me a big hug mm -hmm. and said in German, you know, a Vita saying. And I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. I was going to ask you, you, you have told us about dealing uh, with the German troops and the, the ones that were not as good as, the, uh, not as compliant as the others were. What about your relationship with civilians? You were an American representing yeah. uh, an occupying force. You know, one of the things of it is you, you weren't going to meet anybody that agreed with Hitler. Everybody you met, that when you threw that question at them, they were saying they were forced to do what they would, they'd done. And in, in context, you can actually believe that because if somebody puts a gun to you and threatens to shoot you, 
if you don't do certain things, you're going to do it, regardless. And uh, uh, Elizabeth's father was a tall man, a typical German, and uh, he maintained to this day that he did not join the army. He was forced to join. And as soon as he got a chance to get out, he got out. And uh, fortunately, his family was still living. So he came back and uh, he was a nice guy, nice man. That's the good part of my memory of Germany. But uh, like I say that uh, uh, even in France, uh, well, when you're in a country that has been devastated as much as France was, uh, your ability to trust was a, a big thing. Boy, if you didn't have trust, you didn't have much really. Give us an example of where, where that worked for you. Uh, if uh, somebody tells you that the area that you're about to go into is heavily mined, and then somebody else comes by and tell you, no, that's not true. There's no mines in there. Who are you going to believe? So you've got to take your chances. You've got to trust somebody. Somebody's telling the truth, and somebody's telling a lie. How did you make your judgments? Well, I really made my judgments on the way the person looked me in the eye, uh, the way they talked. Uh, there are a lot of uh, things that pointed to somebody lying, and uh, I hope that I don't have to pay with my life. And uh, it, uh, it paid off because uh, the person that told me the place was heavily mined was lying. Because he'd never looked me in the eye. Uh, you know, he would uh, be looking at the ground or someplace other than right at but me. But no eye contact. No uh, eye contact. Were any men in your uh, organization injured or killed by mines? Yeah. Yeah. They were. Yeah. We, uh, we were going to a going away party and there was an area in the woods that had been, we were told that it had been heavily mined, but the mines had all been taken up. Well, they went. And I was in a Jeep with four other men, blown to bits. The driver was killed. The guy in the front seat was uh, mutilated. And I was the only one to get out alive without a scratch. And it was my opinion that God was with me that day. He was definitely with me that day. And uh, one of the guys come from, uh, the guy that got killed come from North Carolina. And uh, the other guy that was uh, paralyzed, he came from New York. But, uh, uh, Those guys were. Arthur, when you were in the area, uh, Munich, Nuremberg, um, Weisberg, oh, yeah. Weimar, yeah. there are three major concentration camps in that area. Right. Did you see any of those or 
Um, uh, those uh, prisoners? Yes. Uh, we were able to, uh, we were on a truck convoy, and we were able to see, I don't know which uh, group of uh, Nazis they were, but we were able to observe uh, some of the Nazis that were on trial there. At Nuremberg? At Nuremberg. Yeah. And oh boy, uh, the, the feeling amongst the guys that were on the truck was uh, one that I wasn't very proud of, but that's the way things happen. Other than your um, close call in a jeep, were you at any other time wounded or injured in, uh, nope. in the area you were in? No, nope. that's uh, the closest time. Uh, uh, I couldn't believe that when I became conscious and was able to feel if my legs and arms and things were still there, I still couldn't believe it. And uh, I asked uh, the nurse who was there if I was whole. She said, you sure are. Mm. And uh, I uh, was thankful for that. Uh, As a military man, you were prepared to fight the Germans. Right. Um, you were taught to. Right. You were taught, um, you knew of their history. Right. And then you went over and, and met them and talked to civilians who had been right. uh, under the Nazis. Right. Um, what was your feeling toward them and uh, your, your feeling about what you had been taught and the reality of facing these people? Uh, one of the things of it is, like I say, that uh, when I would meet people that said they were forced to do what they did. I had to take that in a contents of how they said it and what they said. And by that I mean uh, some of them were adamant to the fact that they had to do what they did. And others were apologetic about what they had to do. And uh, one of the things that I used to ask all of them, did you take advantage of collaborating with the authorities? And some of them would say, yes, and some of them, no. But the ones that said yes, I could look around and see from where they were living that they had taken advantage because their house hadn't been destroyed. Uh, they had the finest of furniture. And the others were, uh, some of them were living in shelters and uh, you could see where, uh, even though they did collaborate, they had a hard time. But uh, like I said, that uh, the Germans were, uh, you know, when things got real tight for Hitler, he was a madman, and you can see why uh, the people dropped off uh, the Hitler bandwagon. But uh, Where did you go from Germany, Arthur? From Germany? Uh, we came home to the States came into New York Harbor. You sailed back across the Atlantic. Yeah, sailed back. <laughs> you know, everything was on ship then, you know. Yeah. And uh, Were you met at the pier by anybody or 
No. The no. war was over, so you were coming home. And oh, right. And coming into New York Harbor, there was a big sign, uh, Welcome home, boys. Well done. Now, I'm standing at the rail with a friend of mine, and he says, boy, that's a hell of a big sign there. I says, where? I couldn't see the sign. He says, don't you see that sign there? I said, no. He said, man, you better get your eyes checked. <laughs> and that was the first time I realized I had uh, an eye problem. But uh, The Army hadn't recognized that? No, no. But you landed in New York, and then what did you do? Uh, uh, I, we went to a, a camp that was to uh, get us ready for uh, uh, discharge. And during the time I was there, I ran into uh, a lieutenant from South Boston. I don't know how I did that, but anyhow. He got to talk to me about what was the process I was going through. So I told him. He says, oh, you can do better than that. Hey, they're talking about three or four days. I can get you out of here in a day. So I said, huh. He said, you follow me. He took me to another place and got in line. And I was out in two days, less than two days. <laughs> so he says, if you, uh, you know, if anybody encounters you, just tell them that, uh, I think this guy's name was Murphy. Anyhow, you just tell them, Lieutenant Murphy, put me in this line. You'll be all right. That's what happened. I was on a train the next day. Was, just to go back a second, was your eye problem anything that had happened to you in the service or I as a result I, of I that? I don't know whether it was or not. I can't say it was and I can't say it wasn't. But, uh, since uh, since that time, uh, have you had any support from the uh, military hospitals, soldiers' oh, hospitals, no, or anything like that? No. See, a few years ago, I was diagnosed with diabetes, and that's a progressive thing, mm -hmm. and it usually ends up affecting your eyes. So that's what they tell me now. Okay. Where did that train take you? Were you going home? Well, came right to Newtonville. I uh, got off in uh, Boston and took the train out to Newtonville. Surprised everybody in my house because I had never let them know that I was coming home. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> oh boy, that was a big surprise. And see, my brother, my oldest brother, he was home from Italy and had been home like uh, a year ahead of me. And boy, that was a great reunion to see him. I hadn't seen him in three years. Yeah. And uh, I have two younger brothers now that live down in Newton. Uh, they remember that day. So you yeah. were discharged from the Army about New York, in New York somewhere? Right. Or New Jersey? Yeah. It's a funny thing to ask you at this time now, but um, what was the most, can you think of the most memorable experience in your whole career in, this, in the military? Well, to be truthful and fair, I think when Elizabeth's father came and hugged me and kissed me. And Alvita saying, that was the most memorable thing in my military history. Uh, he was a man that fought against me, who was our enemy. To do such a thing, I thought it was uh, not only uh, commendable, but 
the heart and soul of another man. Were you ever in touch after that time, Arthur, with uh, no. that man or, or Elizabeth? I was in touch with Elizabeth sometimes, but it finally fell apart. But uh, I'll never forget that. And uh, that, uh, I think, was one of the most memorable things that ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. It would be. In the Army. Well, aside from that gentleman, was there any other memorable character that served oh, with you? Characters? Characters, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> there were a whole bunch of them. <laughs> Tell us about one of them. One of, well, it's not a good one. Uh, we had a guy in our company that had been a combat person, and they called him Pee Wee because of his small stature, and that bugged him. And uh, he had been down to the PX, and one of the MPs had come in there and given him a hard time. And uh, he was feeling no pain, and uh, he, when he left, he says, I'm gonna get that SOB, and nobody paid much attention to him. So uh, that light after the uh, uh, place was getting ready to close, we heard this shot in the alley, and nobody even paid attention to go and look. And here that MP was, sprawled out in the alley with a hole in his head. And right away, everybody that was there knew it was Pee Wee that did it. Now he stayed in my tent. So the MPs came <laughs> directly to my tent. So I asked them who they were looking for. So they said, you know who we're looking for. I says, well, he's not here. So uh, uh, at the time, they had a search out for him and it wasn't long before they caught him. And the last thing I heard about him, he was on his way to Fort Leavenworth, uh, you know, that's the military. Kansas, yes. Kansas, yeah. Yeah. And uh, After you came home um, with a lot of other guys, boatloads of guys, how were you received uh, as a veteran returning from the military services? Well, to be truthful, I got on a bus one day and there was a white lady sitting. So I sat down beside her and she liked to climb out the window trying to get away from me. Where was this? In West Newton. So I told her, lady, <laughs> you don't have to worry about me sitting next to you because you can have this whole seat yourself because I'm going to move. So the, the bus driver wanted to know, why are you moving? And I said, well, let's forget about it. So when I got home, I told my mother about it. She says, you've got to be tolerant to those kind of things because you're going to run into them further on in life. So my mother was a very patient lady. And uh, uh, sh I think she had to be because my dad died when he was only 42 years old. And uh, Ma was only 40. And uh, she raised all four of us, and done an excellent job. So some of the things that I learned from her, I, I still carry on as a part of what I learned as a younger person. Did you join any veterans groups? Any oh, yeah. organizations when I you belong, came home? I belong to all of them down there in Newton. <laughs> 440, 
and uh, veterans of foreign wars. And I joined uh, the veterans of foreign wars after I became uh, connected with the police. But uh, the other, uh, well, 440, I belonged to that for a long time. What is the 440? Uh, a, a veterans organization. I see. Yeah. How important to you was serving in the military of the United States? Well, I'll tell you. I don't see what my future would be if I hadn't have joined. Uh, having joined and served was a lesson in tolerance and uh, I, I forget how to put it, but uh, to be able to get along with people. Because everybody that I ran into in the military weren't exactly friendly. Uh, some of the people that I had to uh, deal with uh, were unfriendly and just uh, hard to get along with. So uh, I'm thankful that the Lord gave me that type of uh, tolerance to get along with what I had to deal with. Maybe you have just answered the next question I was going to ask you, how it affected the rest of your life. You apparently learned lessons in the military that had stayed with you forever. <laughs> You know, one of the things I was, it just came to me was, if somebody makes a decision and they're pretty sure of it, wait a minute, wait a while, they'll change their mind. And sure enough, all through life, that's what has happened. I've had uh, people tell me that you can't do this or you can't do that. And I just took it in stride and waited. Sooner or later, they changed their mind. <laughs> oh boy. That's a good lesson to learn. Oh boy. Just wait a minute. Yeah. Arthur, you went into an experience that um taught you a great deal and it sometimes was pretty unhappy for you and you almost got killed. Is there one thought or memory more than anything else that you would like to share with us today or your family or people who will be looking at this tape a long time from now? Well, because I have such a large family that still I have one son that has the same temperament that I do, and his name is George, and he lives in Peabody. He's a quiet person, like I was, and he has the ability to stand and look back at things and visualize them as something that he would do. And uh, George is a touring officer now for the city of Boston. And I'm quite sure that he uses uh, this technique in his work. Because there, some people say there are no bad kids. But in certain instances, there are some bad kids but you had to make sure you put them in the right context. Can they be helped? 
if they can't be helped, you're in a world of trouble. But in most cases, they can be helped if the right technique is used. And you feel George got some of that I from you? I think George got yeah. some of that. That's very good. When he uh, uh, played football for Natakai, he was a roving guard. And therefore, he had to change his position when they lined up. If the other team was in a certain offensive drive, and uh, when the game was over, I had to meet him down on the field, and I was I had to congratulate him for doing an excellent job because uh, his uh, mo movement on the line after the other team had got lined up was instrumental to uh, Natick beating uh, 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 Norwood, no, not Norwood. Uh, I forget the name of the team. No, that's a, that's a good story. You have just said that George is very flexible. Yeah. Is there anything I haven't asked you today that you would like to uh, speak to to get on the tape before we finish here? You know, one of the things of it is, my father was a disciplinarian. When we got up on Saturday, because we had no sisters, we had to do dishes, we had to do the laundry, we did everything possible to help my mother. And that was due to the fact that my dad had instilled in us to do everything possible in the house to help her. And that carried on all through our younger and teenage years. And when I went in the military, my brother went in the military, and we got orders from the sergeant or whoever, there was no hesitation. We did. We did what he asked. And that was because we come from a family of disciplinarians. Like I said, my dad was a disciplinarian. And uh, I was thankful for it. Very thankful for it. Oh boy, to get some people that when they're told to do something, they, they will rebel just because of the fact of they're able to rebel. But if you stand back and look at what you were asked to do, it's no big deal. No big deal. Arthur, we, we thank you very much for coming in today. Uh, you told us a very, very interesting story, and I'm sure people a long time from now are going to appreciate looking at it. Thank I, you very much. I hope so. I hope so.